Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Notice the Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Amen. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Amen. We'll stop there. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, please bless the message as I uh, somewhat teach uh, this subject once again that no doubt is necessary to say over and over again these things. And so I pray as I speak tonight that you'd please fill me anew and afresh with thy spirit. May we give our attention to thee and to thy word this evening. And please, we ask your word to have free course tonight. Uh, stir our hearts in this uh, subject, really the whole series of why we are what we are. And may we learn tonight that. Please remove any distractions tonight from this room and from our minds, and may we give our attention to Thee. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to continue with the series that I started several weeks ago, a series I preached, I think it was, it was a 10 or 11 years ago now, of why I am still a Baptist. The first series was why I am a Baptist, and this series is why I am still a Baptist years later, I'm still a Baptist, and I trust you are as well. That's why you're here tonight. Uh, I trust you're here because you're an independent Baptist by conviction. Uh, not because you just, you know, put names of denominations in a hat and pulled one out and said, okay, I guess that's what I'm going to be. Uh, but you're that by conviction. Now, for the past several weeks, we've been looking at the marks of a New Testament church or what it is that makes us Baptists. Why do we have that name? What is it that makes us Baptists? You know, I believe that one of the most important things for a church and for parents to do with the next generation is to teach them not only what they believe, but why they believe it. That is essential. If I could beat that drum and make that statement a hundred times, I would, but I, th I know you'd be annoyed by that. Again, to teach not only what we believe, but why we believe it. I think we've lost an entire generation because we haven't done that. We've just told them, this is what you believe. And if someone were to dare ask why, well, just be quiet and sit down. That's not the way to deal with it. Uh, you're going to lose people that way. And that's what's happened in our culture. Uh, Ken Ham, in his book, Already Gone, states some very sobering st statistics concerning the spiritual state of our nation and of our Christian young people. You ought to read that book and see some of the statistics. I won't quote them here. But today in America, we have more Christian churches, more seminaries, more Christian bookstores, more Christian resources, more Christian radio stations, more Christian TV programs than any other nation in the world. Or, or should I say, and more than any time in the history of our nation. There's stuff everywhere. Well, can I ask you something? Are we becoming more Christian or less Christian? What's the problem? The obvious answer is less. You know, Barna Research writes this, quote, Over the years we have seen a generational shift in the moral compass of Americans. 25% of the current generation of young people, termed Generation Z, I don't know who comes up with these names, but I don't, but I, I, what's after Z? I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's going to be the rapture, that's why it's Generation Z. But anyway, born 1999 and later, imagine they strongly agree that what is morally right and wrong changes. That's the attitude of today. That morality changes with the wind. And it depends on how you feel what is right and wrong. By the way, this has doubled since the baby boomer, boomer generation. That's the 1946 to 1964. How many baby boomers do we have in here? Right here. All right. Amen. <laughs> Nearly 25% of Generation Z also strongly agree that each person is their own moral compass. In other words, whatever truth you believe is your truth, whatever truth they believe is their truth, uh, and, and truth, again, is relative, depends on who you are, and there's different truth. That's absurd. Amen. Truth is truth, is it not? 66% of Generation Z also believe that it's not wrong to lie. Well, welcome to politics, amen? <laughs> 
We almost expect it anymore. But people lie, and it's no big deal. That's this generation. Uh, uh, even those of Generation Z who are regular church attenders are not too be far behind statistically in their views as well. We are told that those who faithfully attend Sunday school are more likely to leave church than those who do not. That's interesting. Those uh, who faithfully attend Sunday school are more likely to believe that, that the Bible's not true. They're more likely to defend things like gay marriage and premarital fornication. That's what we're seeing today. Why is that? You know, this generation that we're seeing today is growing up in a complex world, and they have access to more information and ideas than any other generation before them. And so if we're not giving them truth, someone else will fill the void. Amen. And that's what they're doing. I believe sincerely that one of the reasons that we have seen so many second-generation Christians leave the church, some even become antagonistic towards God and His Word, towards the church and God's people, is for the most part because we have failed to teach them why we believe what we believe. Amen. I truly believe that. Amen. And that's what this series is about. It's about telling us, understanding, why are we Baptists? Why do we believe what we believe? Uh, what is a Baptist and why are we? Is, is it biblical to be a Baptist? I believe it is. And I hope you do as well. So let's look at that tonight. Now, so far, we've looked at three of the eight marks of what a Baptist church is. We've used the acrostic. Notice B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S -S, for memory's sake. It's a memory tool to remember what it means to be a Baptist or what is a New Testament church. What is a Baptist church? What's the doctrine about? And we saw that B, if you'll notice on your sheet, is believers' baptism only by immersion only. I hope you believe that tonight. There's no other baptism that's a valid baptism than it's a believer and by immersion only. All others are not biblical and they are not baptisms. Then we see A, the authority and inerrancy of the Bible. We believe the King James Bible is the preserved words of God for English-speaking people. It is perfect. We don't need anything else, amen, for English-speaking people. And it's authoritative because it is the very words of God. Amen. And then last week we saw the priesthood of the believer. The idea that you and I as believers can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can access God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can know what the mind of God is. I can know what he wants me to do. I can know his will for my life. Why? Because I have a direct access to God. But that also means that I'm personally accountable to God as well. I can't blame anybody else for my behavior. Nobody but me. Why? Because I'm a priest. I have access to everything I need. Now tonight we're going to look at this next Baptist distinctive. And that is this. It is the letter T. Uh, there's two T's obviously in Baptist. This one is two church ordinances. Let's talk about that distinctive. Two, there are two church ordinances. When I was younger, you know my testimony, I didn't get saved till I was in my early, very early 30s, and I remember attending certain functions at the Catholic Church. I remember one of them, I've, I went to christenings of babies, I've been there for that. Uh, another was a, uh, was a wedding where there was a mass there, and, and I, although I did, believe it or not, went to a year of Catholic school, I, I did, I didn't understand what in the world was going on. I was very confused. Matter of fact, honestly, I thought but it was a little spooky, the whole thing. Just the darkness of the room and all the cathedral-type things and gothic-type things and the smoke and the, and the gowns and all that. You know, as a young person, you go, ooh, that's a little spooky to me. But anyway, I'm just saying. Well, I remember going to one particular thing, and they were having a mass, and, I, and I'm trying to figure out what is going on. What is that man doing? What is he saying? And he's holding this thing up in the air and he's singing this song, uh, you know, kind of humming these words. Uh, and then he's inviting people to come up and partake of this. And I'm, I'm watching them do that. And I'm kind of perplexed. And I see them kneel down and he takes this, I guess it was a wafer. I know now it was. Puts it in their mouth and takes a cup and does that. And then they get up and they walk over into a room on the side, a little box there. And I don't know what they were doing in there. It was a confession booth. At the time, I didn't know. 
And I was confused. And I remember looking around and, and someone said to me, I think it was my sister, honestly, are you going up? I said, I ain't going up for that. No way. Am I supposed to go up? Am I not supposed to go up? What am I supposed to do? It's very, very confusing. What does all that mean? What does it mean when we did what we did Sunday night? We had the Lord's Supper. Amen. What does that mean? I, I hope we understand. Why do we do that? Amen. And why is it different here than it is in, in a Catholic church or a Protestant church or a Lutheran church? Why is it different? We need to address these. You know, you may know this tonight. But I guarantee you there's a lot of people sitting in this auditorium that don't. There's a lot of young people that have no idea what it means. And we need to talk about these things. We need to preach about them. So let's consider some things about the two ordinances. Number one is this, the description of the ordinances. We say there are two, and that's one of your blanks, by the way, the description of the ordinances. We say there are two ordinances that the Lord Jesus Christ commanded the New Testament church to observe as a church. Amen. Two things. Now we're going to answer the question, why two? Why not three? Why not four? Why not one? Why two? Well, let's first talk about what we believe they are. The first one, uh, letter A, I think it is on your sheet, is baptism. We see that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. I just read it. Amen. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Amen. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, the baptism we're not going to deal with, although I'll link it together with the other one as I say some things in a few moment, moments. But I'm going to get real deep into that because we dealt with that. That was the first Baptist distinctive. Amen. Believers' baptism only by immersion only. And that's what the Bible is clear it is. It's for believers only by immersion only. And then the second one is, let it be, the Lord's Supper. Now we see that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. It's also called communion. Amen. We get that from 1 Corinthians. If you want to write that down, you may want to know these things. I don't have everything on the sheet. But it's also called communion. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. It's also called in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, the Lord's table. Amen. Let's just go there. I see people writing it down. So let's go ahead and look at it real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's look at verse 16. <clears throat> They're both right next to each other. Notice a cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not, here it is, the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Why is it called communion? Because it expresses our connection, if you will, our relationship with Jesus Christ. Hopefully we're in communion with him, amen? Going the same way, on the same page. We know him as Savior, and we're walking with him. When you partake, and I partake of the Lord's Supper, that's what we're proclaiming. I am in communion with God. That's why we say stop and pray and make sure you're right with God, because according to 1 Corinthians 11, if you don't do that and you eat of it unworthily, you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. Amen. That doesn't mean you're going to be sent to hell. It just means you're better. You're, you're the chastening hand of God upon you. Amen. So it's a serious thing. Amen. That's why it's called sometimes communion. We're having communion or we're having the Lord's Supper. Look at verse 21, if you will, of the same chapter. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of, here it is, the Lord's table. It's also called the Lord's table. Amen. Now, if we go back to Acts chapter 2, where we started, we also see that in the book of Acts, as, uh, on at least two occasions, if not more, it is also referred to as the breaking of bread. Amen. Notice, if you will, chapter 2, again in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in praise. You say, well, I thought they just had a meal. They were breaking bread. No, that's the word before that, fellowship. They had fellowship, but then they broke bread. That has to do with the Lord's Supper. Now, the Lord's Supper is to be observed. This is not your blank, but it's to be observed by those who are saved and scripturally baptized 
and a member of the church. Notice the pattern we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. Then they that gladly received his word, that's salvation, were baptized, that's baptism, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's church membership. Look down in verse 47 at the end, and the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. They identified to themselves with one another as part of the Lord's church. So the Lord's Supper is to be observed by someone, those that are saved. If you're not saved, you don't observe it. You need to be saved first. Then baptized and members of the church were to do it as a church. That's what we're to do. So we observe the Lord's Supper as a church. If I were to go to visit a like faith church uh, and they were having communion, I would not partake of it because it's not my church. We're to do it as a church. Uh, I would pass it by. If you want to partake, that's fine. That's up to you. I would not. And now we are to do it, notice if you will, this is your blank, as a memorial because that's what it is. We are to do it, why? To remember what Jesus Christ did for us. Now let's go over to, there's a few places, Luke 22, if you would please, and we'll hang there for perhaps a few moments. We're going to go back and forth with a couple things. But Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ in the upper room, and he is with the first church, his church, my church, and he is instituting here this Lord's Supper. Verse 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Here it is. This do in remembrance of me. Amen. That's what he said to do. Christ said it. it doesn't that sound biblical to you? Amen. This do in remembrance of me. He didn't say this do in order to be saved. He didn't say this do in order to get some special means of grace upon you. He said this do in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 repeats that and says this do in remembrance of me. That means that the bread and the grape juice that we use are symbolic. Amen. They are symbolic, okay? Uh, notice again in verse 19 of Luke 22, he says, And he took the bread, took bread, and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, Notice, this is my body which is given for you. Notice it is symbolic. He wasn't saying he, he, this is his flesh, literally. He was saying, it was, he was using a metaphor here. This is my body. It represents my body. Partake of it. Do it in remembrance of me. The grape juice is symbolic of Jesus Christ's blood. Look at verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Again, he's using metaphor. It is symbolic of Christ's blood. So think of it for a moment, if you will. Okay? This is why if the body is, is or the bread is a picture of his body, and the grape juice is a picture of his blood, this is why we do not use bread with leaven or yeast. Amen. We don't. You say that stuff we use is awful flat tasting. It sure is, and it's supposed to be. Because it is, there is no yeast in it, there is no leaven, because in the Bible, leaven is always a symbol of sin. And if that's a picture of Christ's body, it cannot have sin in it. No leaven, no yeast, therefore it is unleavened bread. We also do not use fermented grape juice. Some churches use alcoholic wine to observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, that's not only a symbol of sin because it's leavened or fermented, but it is also sin to drink it at all because drinking alcohol is sin. Amen. amen. That's a good spot for an amen right there. Amen. Now, the bread and the grape juice, remember, since it's a memorial, understand, they have no special powers. 
you're not eating of it and somehow you just get this warm feeling all over you and the grace of God especially upon you in some way. No, no, that's probably the lunch you had that afternoon that's doing that to you. It is not anything that God is giving you through that bread. Uh, it doesn't, it offers no special grace. It has no special grace. They are simply used as symbols to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. You know, human beings have a tendency uh, to want to get like grace out of things. You know, you know what I'm talking about? They want to touch something religious uh, to make, to get some sort of good luck or some kind of charm, you know, bracelet or something that will get God's blessings upon them. It doesn't work that way. When we were in Israel, we were up by the River Jordan where the uh, Sea of Galilee, it flowed out into the River Jordan up there, and, and they had this big, beautiful spot, many, several of you have been there, where they, they said, if you all want to be baptized, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Of course, we, we, didn't, we didn't do it, okay, uh, because we were already baptized, right? But it was so interesting, because I am talking hundreds and hundreds of people, busloads of people, lined up, put on these, these, these uh, white gowns, I mean, lined up by the herds, and to sit back and watch them go into this water and act as if it had some sort of uh, medicinal fa uh, benefits or healing powers or some sort of grace. I mean, they were just so into that. That's not what it is. Amen. They're symbols. Right. Baptism, there's no grace in those waters. There's no special powers in those waters. It's simply a picture, both of the ordinances, of what Jesus Christ did. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. And so they are simply symbols, uh, the description of the ordinances. Number two, write this down. Not only the description of the ordinances, but also the distinction of only two ordinances. How do we know, or should I say, why do we say that there are only two ordinances? Why do we say that it's only baptism and the Lord's Supper? Why don't we, like some other churches, consider foot washing as an ordinance? Well, it's not an ordinance, and I thank the Lord for that. Amen? Amen. I do. Not that I wouldn't want to be a servant, but you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, what, but some do consider foot washing an ordinance. Why do we not consider wearing a head covering an ordinance? Some churches believe that wearing a head covering is an ordinance. We don't. Why is that? Well, we're Baptists. What's well, more to it than just that? Although that's true. Uh, there are, here's why. How do we know something qualifies for an ordinance? What would make it an ordinance? Well, I'm going to show you right here. Some of you have heard this before. But there are three logical requirements of an ordinance. An ordinance, first of all, letter A on the back sheet, back side of your sheet, is this. An ordinance had to be, first of all, commanded by Christ to the church. It was commanded by Christ to the church to observe. Amen. And we see that both baptism and the Lord's Supper were things that Jesus Christ commanded the church to do. Let me, let me show you the first one. Let's talk about baptism. You know the scriptures. Go to Matthew 28, if you would, please. Matthew 28. Here he's speaking to the local church here, the first church, the early church here that would later be empowered at Pentecost. The church was birthed during the ministry of Christ and his disciples. It was empowered uh, uh, corporately at Pentecost and we see him telling this, the church here in Matthew 28, 19 Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That word teach has the idea of making disciples of. In other words, get them saved, amen. And then notice he says, secondly, baptizing them in the name of the Father. Notice it's not names, it's one name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is what we understand as the Great Commission. So we see quite clearly that baptism was something Christ commanded the church 
to do. That's why we baptize as a church. If I was out with uh, someone soul winning, I led someone to the Lord, even though I am the pastor of the church, and they said to me, could you baptize me in my, in my backyard pool? I would say no, because we do that as a church, with the church present. So you need to come uh, to the church, not the building, the gathering of the people. We could be out in a, in a river somewhere, and I'll do it there. But the point is this, is that it was given to the church to do, not to individuals. How about the Lord's Supper? Is that the same thing? Yes. Go back to Luke chapter 22. Did Christ command the church to do that as well? Yes. Amen. Yes, he did. And I already read it, but we'll read it again just for emphasis sake. In verse 19, and he took bread. Now, watch this. Where is he? He's in the upper room. Who's there? The church. The early disciples. My church. Those he's been with. You say, well, who's the pastor of that church? <laughs> Jesus Christ is the pastor of that Amen. church. Amen. And notice what he says in verse 19. He took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Here it is. This do. Sounds like a command to me. Amen. This do in remembrance of me. And again, he, 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 he not only told them to do it, he even observed it with them he, while he was there the night he instituted it. So we see that these two ordinances were, uh, these are ordinances because Jesus Christ commanded the church to do them. There's a second thing, a, qualify, a qualifier of an ordinance, and that's letter B. It also has to be carried out by the first century church. Now here's what I mean by that. When you read the book of Acts, what are you reading? You say the Bible. Yes, I know that. More than that, uh, by that I mean this. It is the inspired historical account of the first century church. Amen. It is the inspired, not, not an error in it. You, want, you ever want to, it's a perfect history right there in the book of Acts. The inspired historical account of the first century church. Now, if these are things that Jesus Christ commanded the local church to observe, then don't you think it makes sense and logic, it would be logical that we should see them doing these things in the book of Acts. Amen. We should see them baptizing and we should see them observing the Lord's Supper. You say, do we? Yes. Amen. You know that. Absolutely. Go look at Acts chapter, go back to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to do a little flip here through the book of Acts for a moment here. Do you know that the church of Jerusalem performed thousands of baptisms? Amen. Thousands of them. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. I've read it already. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So we see 3,000 baptisms in one day. Praise the Lord for that. Go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. Acts chapter 8. Lick your thumbs if you got to. We're going to do some flipping tonight. Amen. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. Uh, here we see Philip as a missionary sent out of the church of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 13, then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 38. Here, Philip again, as being sent out as an evangelist or a church planner, if you will, from the church at Jerusalem. He's there in there with the Ethiopian eunuch. We read in verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So we see the church at Jerusalem performing thousands of baptisms. How about the church at Antioch? Really, those are the two primary churches in the book of Acts. It's the church of Jerusalem, pretty much highlighted from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 11. Then it kind of shifts to the church at Antioch, and we see their church planning out of the church of Antioch that the apostle Paul did. So the two main churches in the, church, in the book of Acts is, are the church at Jerusalem and the church at Antioch. Did they baptize as well? Sure they did. 
Sure they did. Look at Acts chapter 16. As Paul is sent out on his second missionary journey, planting churches, uh, before they were constituted, he was under the authority of the church at Antioch. And when people got saved in Acts chapter 16, we see Lydia and her household in verse 15. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. So we see her being baptized. Look at verse 33 of chapter 16. You say, preacher, you're moving tonight. I am. And we're going to be moving. Acts chapter 16 and verse 33. And this is, of course, a Philippian jailer in his household. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, a straight way. Uh, look at Acts chapter 18 and verse 8. As Paul went into Corinth and planted a church there under the authority of the church of Antioch, he was sent out as a church planner. We read in verse 8, believers at Corinth, and Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. One more, Acts chapter 9, 19 and verse 5. Here he is in Ephesus. I won't get into all the details, but he met some disciples who were not truly saved, but they were baptized by John. That's all they knew. And he said, well, what, what, you're not even saved. And he led them to the Lord. And we read in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. My point is this, did the early church practice this ordinance? Yes. Amen. Over and over and over and over and over again. Amen. We see it. How about the Lord's Supper? Did they observe the Lord's Supper? Yes, they did. We won't go there. We've been there three times already. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, uh, we read that they were the breaking of bread. Uh, uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine uh, and, in and in prayers and in fellowship and breaking of bread. They observed the Lord's Supper. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Here's the church at Troas. Paul is there. Uh, he meets up with them. And we read in verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Point is, again, as we look at the book of Acts, we see that they did indeed, yes, Christ commanded it, but we also see them doing it or performing it or carrying it out in the first century church. Church. So that is a second qualification of, of something to be an ordinance. There's a third one, and that is this, uh, letter C. Not only was it commanded by Christ to the church, not only was it carried out in the first century church, letter C, it was also cited in the New Testament church epistles. In other words, when I understand the book of Romans the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the book of Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians are all what we call church epistles. Some call them Pauline epistles, some call them Christian church epistles, and, and others were Hebrew church epistles for like Hebrews and James and so forth. But my point is this, they were, these epistles, these letters, were written to either individual churches or to groups of churches. Some of them were circular letters uh, that went around. And one of the reasons that these letters were written were, was to give doctrinal instruction to the churches. Now you would think if these ordinances were something they were all supposed to do, and new churches are being multiplied as the Apostle Paul is writing to them, giving them doctrine and instructing them. Somewhere along the line, you'd think you'd hear about the ordinances. Uh, and, the, and you do. They are there. Let me show you what I mean. Go to Romans chapter 6. Are we having fun yet? Amen. I'm trying to keep you awake. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 6. Notice verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Amen. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life. 
In other words, he's saying that baptism that you did when you were baptized by immersion was a picture of something. It was a picture of your salvation and you being dead to the old man. Now you're alive to the new man and you can walk by the power of the Holy Spirit in the newness of life. And your baptism pictured that. 1 Corinthians 12, we won't go there. Well, let's go there because, we're, why not? Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. Notice we read, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made, been made, I'm sorry, have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Point is this, is we see it mentioned in the New Testament church epistles. Now this is very, very important. Because let's take some things and put them to the test. Again, we've seen that both baptism and the Lord's Supper were commanded by Christ to the church. We see it carried out by the first century church. And we see it cited in the New Testament church epistles. Okay, let's take that logical test and apply it to foot washing. Now, don't answer out loud because you might get the answer wrong. But did Jesus Christ tell the disciples to wash his feet? Or uh, didn't he wash, to wash one another's feet? Didn't he tell them to do that? The answer is yes. He did. But it wasn't a, an ordinance it was a picture of what it meant to serve one another. Amen. He was showing a principle there, not giving an ordinance. You say, well, how can you be so sure? Well, where do you find one occasion of foot washing in the entire book of Acts? Just go ahead and do this. No, not once. It's not there. Do we see it mentioned ever in the New Testament church epistles to the churches? Answer, just do this. No. So we see it, it doesn't qualify for an ordinance. Uh, how about wearing a head covering? Did Jesus Christ anywhere in the gospel records command the church to wear a head covering? No. 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 Do we find that anywhere in the book of Acts? No. Do we find a mention of that, that somewhere in the New Testament? Yes, in 1 Corinthians, but not as a church ordinance. In fact, it's about woman's submission to man, and God says, it's not the ha it, your hair, ladies, is what the covering's supposed to be. He's talking about there. And so that's not a church ordinance either. That's why we, as independent Baptists, we say there are only two of them, and that is baptism and the Lord's Supper. And again, saved, baptized, member of the church, observing the Lord's Supper. That is the order. It is done as a memorial, and a memorial alone. So we see, number one, the description of the ordinances. Number two, we see the distinction of only two ordinances. And number three, and we're done right here, the deviation from the two ordinances. So, why is this distinctive a distinctive? By that I mean, why are we making such a big deal of it? Because it is a big deal. Amen. And perhaps we don't think it's such a big deal, some of us, because we don't realize what a big deal it is. And let me see if I can't convey that to us this evening. It's a big deal because of the implications of these ordinances. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, look what I wrote down the bottom there. When someone deviates from either the meaning of these ordinances, what they mean from it being a memorial, or the mode of these ordinances, how it's done, it is a perversion of the very gospel itself. Amen. I've heard, I read somewhere years ago, I don't have the article, so if you don't like what I say, throw it out, I can't give you the source, but I read it somewhere, that some liberal church was observing the Lord's Supper by using McDonald's cheeseburgers. Now, on one side of my head wants to chuckle, the other side wants to get mad. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. It's funny, but it's not funny. Amen. It's, fun. it's not funny at all. It is absolute blasphemy against God. Because you're saying that's the body of Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me? That is blasphemy against the work of... It is a perversion of the very gospel. That's why if you and I are anywhere in any church uh, and they do not observe it the biblical way, you should not participate in it. Amen. Matter of fact, what you're doing there in the first place? I'm just saying. 
I'm just saying. Just ask him. Do you know Galatians 1.8 says this, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Do you understand that when you pervert the ordinances, you are perverting the gospel message itself? And Christ says, God says in his word, and if someone does that, let him be accursed. That's what the word, uh, it's a word anathema, which literally means in the Greek, sent to hell. Amen. You say, that sounds mean. That's what the Bible says. It's an let him be anathema. Amen. Let him be sent to hell. If somebody preaches another gospel or perverts the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible says anathema to them. Amen. You know, the concise dictionary of Christianity in America states this. Listen closely. Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Orthodox, and many historic Protestant traditions, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Moravians, and Reform, prefer the use of the term sacrament because this term is associated with being a means of grace. That's why we don't call it a sacrament. Now, you read some old-time Baptist history books. The, the word sacrament, like many other words, have changed its meaning uh, over the years. And they had referred to it as a sacrament, meaning it's like a symbol. But that word has changed to become meaning that it's a means of grace. In other words, they believe that somehow that is taking part in your salvation. In other words, the Roman Catholics and the vast majority of your Protestant religions practice communion or practice baptism for reasons other than being symbolic, and they make it a part of salvation. That's wrong. That's ungodly. And as Bible-believing Baptists, we reject that belief. Oh, I remember those old Baptists that were forced to go into the Massachusetts Bay Colony and their congregational church meetings, and because they were under arrest for preaching the gospel in uh, Massachusetts, they would force them on the weekend to come and sit in one of those services, and quite often when they had some sort of christening or something like that, they would, they would stand up, turn around, and look at the back wall and fold their arms. Now, they couldn't leave because they physically restrained them. But they said this, we're not looking at that because it's unbiblical. You see, it's unbiblical and it makes Christ's work on the cross of Calvary insufficient for salvation. It is saying that the blood of Jesus Christ isn't enough, that the work of Christ isn't enough. Somehow I have to do something to earn or to help that get more grace uh, from God when that is not true. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Uh, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And any time you add works to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it ceases to be great grace. It ceases to be Christ alone and it becomes yourself. Amen. God help us. Amen. So many of us don't think it's such a big deal. You know, in 1215 A.D., Pope Innocent III, <laughs> that's his name. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Decreed the doctrine of transubstantiation, which states that the bread turns into the literal body of Jesus Christ and the the wine they use turns into the literal blood of Jesus Christ. And they forced in England, uh, when it was under the reign of Henry VIII, they forced uh, in England everybody to observe it. You had to get your baby christened. You'd be persecuted. You had to partake of the Lord's Supper, or what they called Mass, or you'd be persecuted. In March of 1545 in England, under the reign of Henry VIII, there was a 25-year-old young lady by the name of Anne Askew. Anne Askew was a, was a feisty lady. She knew the Bible. She knew what the Word of God said. And she lived under the reign of Henry VIII where the forced religion was Roman Catholicism. And she did not want to uh, agree that the wine turns into the literal blood. Matter of fact, she refused to accept that false teaching. Amen. 
She believed what the Bible says, that it was a memorial, and she refused to keep quiet about it. Because of her views, she was arrested, charged with interpreting the scriptures contrary to the Catholic faith. That was her charge. They demanded that she recant her belief and accept transubstantiation. And she de they demanded that, they sh they, that she would tell others that believe like her. Where are they? We want to find these people that you're hanging out with that are propagating this belief. She refused to tell them. Amen. So they started to interrogate her. They placed her on what's called the rack. I don't know if you've ever seen what a rack is or the rack is. It's where they take your hands and they tie them up and they lay, it's basically almost like a cot looking type thing where they would tie your hands up on this end and tie your ankles up on this end to ropes and they would slowly crank your body apart to stretch your, your body out. And she was put on that rack. She was put on that rack and slowly tightened and as they tightened one after the other, they said, are you ready to recant yet? And she said, I will not. They tightened her body so tight that her body was five inches above the place that she was laying on. It was so tight, it was actually suspended in the air. We're told by historical records that she, her, her, her shoulders were dislocated. They became dislocated. Her hips became dislocated. Her elbows became dislocated. And her knees became dislocated. And she still said, I will not recant. Amen. She was unable to walk because of all those dislocations. So they put her in a chair and they brought her to the execution. They brought her to the stake and they stopped her there in this chair and they had her look at the stake. And they said this to Anne Askew. They said, you're going to recant now? You're going to accept transubstantiation? She said, no. Amen. Hundreds of people were there watching. They knew what was going to happen. They set the date for her execution. They had to move the crowd away to bring her in and haul her to that stake. And that's what they did. She was fastened to the stake by a chain to hold her up. And again, before they lit the match, they said, are you willing to recant? She said no. Amen. Amen. And she was burnt alive in front of this great crowd. She went to heaven. Someone that stood by recorded this, and you take this as you will. I'm just telling you what they wrote. They said when that happened and her spirit left her, they said the sky discolored. And there was a sudden clap of thunder at the moment it happened. It caused everybody to stop for a moment and be in awe. Amen. Anne Askew was 26 years old when this happened. Amen. This is how important this distinctive was to her. Amen. So I ask you tonight myself, how important is it to us? Amen. Is it a big deal? Amen. I think it is. Amen. Anything that perverts and changes the gospel of Jesus Christ is something we need to stand for, or stand Amen. against, I should say, Amen. and stand tall against. Amen. Two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together.